general we start and then at uh, 2.45, Thomas will give you the lecture. Ah, thank you. Uh, thanks for the invitation. I was a grad student here, so it is uh, uh, pretty strange now uh, to come here and give a seminar. I gave uh, almost the same seminar also in Pisa, where I was uh, an undergrad, and it was strange as well. Um, so I hope you will pardon me uh, if I won't give the best seminar ever. Uh, anyway, I also want to thank the people there at Beck for giving me the opportunity to study here. Um, it was great. Now I'm a postdoc in uh, UCLA in Los Angeles. So um, it, it was really, I mean, it opened doors uh, studying here. Uh, and, uh, Soon after finishing in Los Angeles, I will be back in Italy. I got a position, a postdoc position in Padova, so that's another door that uh, got opened for me. Thank you uh, again for all this. Um, the stuff I'll be talking today, I, I will try to be brief because I know you had already enough uh, seminars uh, <laughs> this week, uh, and you will have. Um, it's about a project that I started when I still was uh, uh, at CP3. So it is not something new, but I really wanted to uh, talk about this here because uh, I, I hope this to be my thesis project, uh, but uh, I, I couldn't work, focus my thesis on this because the project was not done yet at the time when I, defend, when I defended the thesis. Um, it, it needed some more work. And finally, uh, we finished uh, that probably almost a year after I graduated. Uh, this is a work with Paolo Panci, who was also a postdoc here at the time I was uh, a grad student, uh, and Marco Cirelli, uh, who is a researcher in France, in Saclay. And now Paolo is also in France, uh, working with Jussi. Um, this is, uh, I, I like to think about this as my present to CP3 after they gave me the opportunity to study here. I had to leave something to them. Um, I, when I came here, Francesco asked me to work on dark matter, and so I tried to learn all this stuff about the dark matter data detection experiments and how they work. You know, it's pretty, um, for a particle physicist and a, and a high energy physicist, it's really not probably nice to start working or, uh, about on in the interaction of particles with nuclei instead of uh, elementary particles. And also, you're used to the GV or TV scale energy is that of the LHC and now you are working with KV uh, scatterings so it's pretty dumb uh, but still needs to be done and I tried to do it and then I thought okay now I'm leaving uh, who else is going to do this here so I tried to produce an uh, automation a tool that kind of everybody can use um, in a simple way so that you can do the, this, the data detection analysis even when I'm not here at CP3 uh, and doing it for you, okay? So the uh, focus is obviously on dark matter. I hope I don't have to explain what dark matter is, and indeed I won't, uh, because we have all these uh, fantastic images from the astronomers and astrophysicists that earns them the, the grants, for instance. Okay, what, are, what is dark matter for me? Uh, dark matter for me is a particle interacting um, with a, with a very low, um, with a very small cross section, and it is not relativistic with a, a mass in the 1 GV to 10 TV uh, ballpark. Okay, so this is more or less uh, uh, the definition of WIMP. But what, what people mean by WIMP is a, a very, um, very weakly interacting massive particles with mass more or less in that in that range. And actually, there are, I will assume there is only one, uh, of, uh, one kind of these particles, uh, which is pretty much like approximating the whole standard model as just hydrogen, which is actually not a bad approximation, at least if you are an astronomer. Okay, this is the basics of data detection, uh, is, is uh, more or less summarized in this uh, slide. You build a detector, 
um, and wait for dark matter particles to arrive and uh, pass across the mountain, you need to put this detector below a mountain or underground anyway to be screened by the cosmic rays. Uh, you wait for a dark matter particle to arrive, hit the nucleus in the detector and leave. So then what you measure is the recoil energy of the nucleus that was initially at rest. So what you measure is basically the energy that is injected by the dark matter inside your detector when the dark matter scatters with the nucleus. Why does the dark matter scatter with the nucleus and not with the particles inside the nucleus because the dark matter, as I said, is not relativistic, so it has a very, very small energy, uh, and therefore um, the De Broglie wavelength of the uh, associated with the scattering energy is lar as large as the nucleus. So you can uh, you can consider the scattering with the, every single component of the nucleus, like protons and neutrons, but then you have to sum up uh, all the uh, amplitudes coherently. Okay, and they can either uh, be announced by this sum or cancel uh, and give a smaller contribution. There are different cases. Okay. So anyway, what you have to consider is, is the scattering with the whole nucleus. And uh, this is what it's, these experiments uh, try to measure. The, this is the number of events um, at a certain recoil energy. So they measure they measure the number of uh, nuclei that have been scattered uh, uh, to a certain recoil energy, ER, okay? This number is proportional to the uh, density of the targets, to the flux of the dark matter. I think this uh, laser is not, the pointer is not working so much, but I can probably do it with my hand. Uh, and the scattering cross-section, okay? Obviously, the flux of dark matter uh, is proportional to the uh, dark matter local density, rho, and to the velocity distribution of the dark matter uh, which in, in our galaxy, which we uh, don't know exactly. So this is just the same formula, basically a bit expanded. Um, this is uh, uh, the target density, this is the dark matter density, the velocity distribution of the dark matter, and the cross-section. Okay, then in order to have a, a more realistic uh, quantity, you also need to take into account the uh, effect of the detector on this measurement. Okay, what the detector uh, tried to measure is this, but then there are all some experimental effects that um, make you um, measure something different. For instance, when you have uh, a scattering inside the detector of, of a certain energy ER, okay, since your detector is not infinitely powerful, you will find that uh, a slightly different energy, a detected energy E prime, okay, and the, you, you have to know what is the probability of given, uh, that given a certain scattering with an energy ER, you will measure in, instead another energy E prime, just because the, the detector uh, has a certain finite energy resolution and it's not perfect, okay? So, for instance, this, this is the energy, uh, the resolution function of the detector. Sometimes it is, usually it is assumed to be a Gaussian, otherwise um, there are um, other, also other forms, it depends on the detector. There is efficiency and all these kind of things. And then you sum over all the targets inside the detector, which again means all the nuclei inside the detector, okay? So this is, <coughs> in the end you have the rate in a certain energy beam, which is not the recoil energy, but is this uh, measured energy. Um, there's also another effect of this Q here, there's the quenching factor that depends again on the target, on the detector. This is, uh, tells you that some part of the energy of the scattering may be lost in the detector. So what you measure is only uh, is proportional to only a part of uh, the true recoil energy in the detector. So you have to take into account all these, uh, uh, all these effects in the end, uh, when in the end uh, you uh, want to compare the outcome of your theory, that is basically this, with uh, the numbers given by the experiments, which are these. So once you do that, and then you take the uh, experimental paper and you look Mm, what's the result? Uh, you see something like this, okay? There are several of these curves and then there are some bananas 
what does it all mean? Okay, first, what is this plot? This is uh, uh, here on the horizontal axis you have the dark matter mass, and on the vertical axis you have uh, a uh, weak nucleon cross section. So this is uh, the cross section of uh, interaction of the dark matter particle with only a single nucleon. Okay. Um, and then what you see are these lines, these are experiments that did, don't find any dark matter signal, so they uh, say, they, they set an exclusion bound, these are exclusions, so everything above these lines is excluded according to this experiment. So if the dark matter had, uh, with, a certain, with a 100 GV mass, had a cross-section here, uh, they would see, this, this experiment, for instance, LUX, would see a lot, of, a lot more, uh, a lot of events, of dark matter events, above their background, and since they don't see these events, uh, they ex exclude this point in parameter space. Okay, on the contrary, if I now zoom in uh, here at low dark matter masses, there are several bananas here. Um, these are the favorite uh, regions in uh, the parameter space uh, um, drawn by those experiments that actually have a signal. Okay, so the, the there is a, here uh, an experiment called DAMA that see um, a signal which seems to be dark matter. They have this nine sigma uh, evidence for a modulation, which you could well explain if the, uh, if, if this, this was be due to dark matter, and otherwise it has, it's a bit tricky to interpret with the background. Okay, there is this uh, CDMS region. They have three events. Um, and so they say, okay, maybe this is dark matter. I don't think they actually believe that, but you cannot exclude the possibility. And if these three events are due to dark matter, they, uh, this is the region in parameter space where the dark matter uh, model should lie. Okay, then there's this cogent and this crest. The crest collaboration more recently uh, analyzed new data. They don't find this excess anymore. So I think uh, this is actually gone now. Okay, however, when you look at these plots, you must be aware of the assumptions uh, underneath, okay? There are two big assumptions behind these plots. One is that it is a, they assume that the experiments, when they do their analysis, they assume a specific interaction, which is um, spin-independent interaction in the case I showed you. Sometimes they also do the analysis for another interaction called spin-dependent. Anyway, for a particle physicist, this spin-independent interaction uh, is something that is produced by these kinds of Lagrangian. Okay, if, if the dark matter is a scalar, you can have a phi dagger phi, and then uh, a, a, a nucleon, or if the dark matter is a fermion, you can have these two um, effective operators, for instance. You can, you can also put a, um, imagine there is a, a very heavy mediator and you integrate it out uh, and in the end you obtain these interactions. Okay? Uh, all these interactions, they are different from a Lagrangian and a high energy quantum field theoretical point of view, but in the end when you take the normal relativistic limit, uh, the, they all give the same uh, interaction cross section. That's why they are all called spin independent. Um, the other assumption is about the uh, astrophysics. Um, the, what is this, the, the velocity distribution, as I said, we don't know it. Uh, the velocity distribution of the dark matter in our galaxy. Uh, what people assume is that this is a, a Maxwell-Boltzmann, uh, meaning that the dark matter halo uh, is thermalized uh, and therefore uh, the velocity distribution follows a Maxwell-Boltzmann um, distribution. That is then truncated at the escape velocity from the galaxy because you don't expect any dark matter particles above that velocity. Okay? <coughs> so well, for the rest of the talk, I will just assume that this is true and uh, everything I will show will be with this assumption. But then I can, uh, all the, the rest of the talk basically shows how you can uh, change this assumption and still get uh, a bound uh, on your model. Okay? Indeed, one can imagine different interactions. Uh, there are there were uh, ser there have been several papers about these uh, uh, in, um, effective operators. You can basically imagine uh, theories where you have all these sorts of operators uh, when you integrate out a heavy mediator. 
Also, people have considered electromagnetic dark matter. Um, for instance, also here, uh, Francesco, Paolo, I, uh, Chris, and also Lucy uh, consider dark matter with the um, dark matter magnetic moment with a magnetic moment, which is this one. So mm, you can uh, you can also take. Uh, I mean, you don't need your mediator to be very heavy. It can also be. Um, the mediator of the interaction can also be a photon, but then you need uh, you can you can have either uh, even even in this case you can have a normalizable operator or non non normalizable operators uh, to create uh, the interaction uh, to induce the interaction of the dark matter with a photon <coughs> in these different ways, for instance. Okay, so there is no so there is no uh, reason to consider only the spin independent interaction or the spin dependent. One can have a lot of other different uh, models. So it would be nice to have basically a framework to, to study all these interactions together uh, instead of having a, like a grad student doing the analysis for this one and another one for this one and stuff like that. So for this reason, this is stuff I already said two years ago almost. It was in my, in my, this part of the talk was in my thesis. Um, there was, these guys have uh, uh, proposed this framework um, to uh, treat all these interactions um, together. Basically, what they noted is that since the dark matter is a non the physics, um, the right degrees of freedom to use are not these quantum fields, which is what you usually use in uh, quantum field theory, in LHC and whatnot, but are the, um, these variables, these uh, variables that you would use in a, a non-relativistic uh, quantum mechanics, okay? So you have the exchange momentum Q between the dark matter and the nucleus, and the nucleon, uh, the velocity of the dark matter, and possibly the spin of the dark matter, and also the spin of the nucleon, okay? So once you uh, have these ingredients, I mean these the degrees of freedom, when, once you have figured out what are the degrees of freedom that you should use, um, then you can basically write any interaction as a, a, a linear combination of these operator, of these non-relativistic uh, operators, okay? Indeed, in the end, the, uh, when you compute the dark matter nucleon cross-section, the amplitude will be given uh, as a linear combination of these non-relativistic operators times some coefficients. Okay, and the coefficients, uh, how do you compute the coefficients? Well, these coefficients will have inside, uh, this depends on the high energy Lagrangian that you start with. Okay, they will contain, contain uh, all the couplings, the masses of the heavy mediator particles, for instance. Uh, they will contain also the dark matter mass, uh, if you have a spinner in your initial Lagrangian, you have to open it and uh, um, expand it in, uh, in the non relativistic limit. Uh, so these coefficients will also have contain some stuff that was initially in your spinner. Anyway, you just need to know that this is the form uh, of the amplitude of the okay of the scattering amplitude with the nucleon of the scattering with the dark matter with the nucleon. Okay. Sorry, Jenny, just to be yes. This is true only for direct detection. This, yeah, yeah, this is true. I'm talking about direct detection. Sorry, I'm talking only about direct detection. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is only about direct detection. Okay, so what was done then in this paper uh, was to basically work out the uh, the nuclear physics. As I said, this is the interaction, the uh, amplitude of interaction with a dark matter particle with a single nucleon. Then you have to sum up over all nucleons, and this is tricky because you have to know how to do this, and there is a lot of nuclear physics that I personally don't know how to do. You really need to be a nuclear physicist, and even if you are, it's tricky, and people don't really know how to do this computation. Do you know like what kind of 
Do they use like a shell model? How do, how do they actually do that? Yeah, these guys use a shell model. Uh, it's it's kind of simple. Uh, it's not very um, elaborate. Uh, they say they, they there is a section in their paper where they explain exactly what they did and what are um, the, the parts of the computation that can be done better. They they admit that this is a, a simple computation. But if, if if we find that this is a a good way to proceed, then someone else can also uh, take over and, and do a better job. Yeah. Also, this uh, this is just. Uh, um, um, how do you say, one nucleon interaction. I mean, you can go on and, and, and consider the interaction with two nucleons at the same time, this, this does not have it. So for instance, for the spin-dependent interaction, there are form factors that are better than this, but only for xenon, as far as I know. Okay, so basically, so they work out, they take some nuclear model and they work out the, the uh, nuclear physics, and then they give all this quick um, F they are called, these functions are called form factors. Once you know that uh, what are these coefficients in your theory that, as I said, only uh, depend on the high energy Lagrangian, then you basically know what is the cross section with, of interaction of the dark matter with the whole nucleus. Okay, you just need to input these coefficients in the formula, and these instead are tabulated in that paper. So this is a pretty easy uh, way to um, find the differential cross-section of interaction of dark matter with nucleus, although you don't really know exactly what, which kind of uh, nuclear physics you're doing because you're just taking some results from some people that hopefully uh, knew what they were doing. <coughs> um, yeah. Okay, so this, is, this has been done in that paper, then um, we took this idea even further. We thought, okay, they they uh, basically gave us the uh, nice recipe on how to compute the cross section uh, with of the uh, of interaction of the dark matter with the nucleus, so that we don't need to know or care so much about the nuclear theory. Okay, which sometimes you don't want to unless you're really picky and and. Uh, uh, maybe uh, you want to, you may want to find uh, a reason of uh, of the uh, dark matter signal in, in the nuclear uh, theory instead of in the uh, high energy theory. Um, I mean, in the nuclear part of the problem instead of uh, uh, in your in your high energy model. Okay. So what what we did was to produce this uh, a generation a gener a gen generalized version of these form factors where we also um, in inserted, we also considered both the velocity distribution of the dark matter and the uh, all the crap that um, comes from the experiment, okay? So once you consider all this stuff together, you can define these generalized form factors and uh, <coughs> you have a very simple formula for the total rate, okay? so. You again have these coefficients that you need to compute from your high energy Lagrangians, and these are given by uh, these formulas, these generalized form factors. Once you know these and you have computed the uh, coefficients, you you have basically a number that can be immediately compared with the experimental results. Okay, so you don't even have, apart from knowing the nuclear physics, apart from knowing the experiments, apart from knowing. Uh, the um, astrophysics of the problem. I mean, you can f basically forget about all of these. Just focus on your high energy uh, model and uh, get the result. This is what I call factorizing fun. Because if you are a particle physicist, you are used to work at very high energy. You don't want to know anything about this crap. You just uh, compute these guys, and we we. Mm, we computed this for you, and this contains all the stuff that you may not want to um, have anything to do with. Okay, we also did something more. We provided basically uh, a way, not, not just to compute this number, but to set 
uh, Im immediately a bound on your dark matter model. Okay, because once you know this number, okay, it's fine, but then you need to um, you need to run some chi square or whatever statistics in order to find a certain bound on your parameter space and stuff like that. Well, we tried to find an automated way to do it. Um, what we did, more or less, uh, we did something that is uh, kind of more involved in this. And here I just tried to uh, um, give a simple explanation. We basically set a bound on a, very, on a simplified model, which is here uh, given by this amplitude. So we computed uh, uh, a simple amplitude, okay, which is just a number. This, for instance, can come out of this uh, Lagrangian. It's, it's a very dumb model. I mean, it's, it's the simplest model one can imagine. It's, it's the simplest amplitude one can imagine, and it can. It's, it's dumb, but not completely dumb. Meaning that there is at least one Lagrangian from which you can compute this. You can have this result. Okay. So this would be our benchmark model. So we basically we uh, want to set we set a bound on this benchmark model on this lambda b that is the coefficients of uh, of the interaction. Okay, it can, It turns out that uh, the for the benchmark model, model, the total rate is given by this guy. Okay, where now we compute. This is already computed by us. This is the uh, generalized form factor, and this is your number, the number that enters your enter your theory. Okay. Then you can define basically this quantity, which is the limit on this number as a function of the dark matter mass so that you can have a two-dimensional parameter space on the horizontal axis, the dark matter mass, and on the vertical axis, this coupling, okay? So this would be the limit on this coupling as a function of the dark matter mass, uh, defined in this way. It's just a, con a straightforward cons consequence of this equation. Once you know what is the top, the... Uh, so yeah, this is, this is the um, limit on the rate imposed by the experiment. So for each experiment, uh, each experiment sees a certain number of events and say, okay, the rate uh, uh, cannot be higher than this. Okay. Okay. So this is only for the benchmark uh, uh, model. For any other model, you have this formula. But then you you can kind of simplify these. Uh, in fact, I mean, you really have to study the the theory, the, the experimental paper, to know what is this limit on the rate, but you can basically cancel it uh, by dividing these guys by the uh, F11, this generalized form factor, and getting these, where now these Y functions are these ratios of the, uh, the ratio of the generalized form factor divided by uh, the general generalized form factor for the operator 11, that is the one of the benchmark, uh, appearing in the benchmark model, okay? So what we do basically is computing, in our paper we computed these uh, y functions so uh, that you just need to know these coefficients. Um, and once you know these coefficients you can compute all the left hand side of these equations and we also compute the benchmark uh, on, um, on the, uh, sorry, the limit on the benchmark uh, parameter, okay? And then you know that in order to have to set a bound on your coefficient that appears here in this uh, um, in this uh, uh, in these numbers that you computed, one, in order to set a bound on this uh, lambda that is your, the coefficient of your theory, you can just use this equation. Okay, and actually it is. Uh, the, pro the procedure is a bit involved to explain, uh, and I think it's even easier than what I said. For this, we um, <coughs> we produce the um, a a apart from giving these uh, these y functions that uh, allows you to compare to, to to compute this part, and also this uh, uh, benchmark limits. Uh, we also have uh, um, a sample file which I think is very easy to use, hopefully, um, if you want to try and give me some feedback so that I know whether it's simple or not. Okay, can be, this can be downloaded from uh, Marco Cirelli's uh, homepage. 
uh, there is a link in the paper. We have considered all these experiments, Xenon 100, CDMS, Coop, Picasso, Lux, and Super CDMS, uh, which are the, uh, mm, the experiments set in the, the most important, most, the tightest bounds. Um, and as I said, there is this uh, sample file. The, there are some examples already worked out in detail, so you can uh, uh, really go and have um, fun with it, hopefully. Okay. So I finish with uh, showing some results. This is uh, stuff that can be done. Once you understand how to work with the code, it is a mathematical code. Uh, I mean, the sample <laughs> file is a mathematical file. Uh, you, you can produce these uh, limits in, uh, in seconds. Um, it is really easy. Okay. Uh, these are, this is the uh, bound for the spin independent cross section. Here we have spin dependent on proton, spin dependent on neutron here. Here we also had fun uh, working out the bounds on this uh, uh, minimal dark matter uh, model. The minimal dark matter is this point here. Okay, it's about um, it's about one TV, I think, or ten, t ten TV, ten TV dark matter, and, and these are the bounds on on these models. Uh, we we also studied a bit the uncertainty in due to the hadronic physics here. So uh, the different colors are different experiments. I think you cannot see them very well. Anyway, let's take this one. This is the Picasso bound. Okay, for each for each experiment, there are several lines which uh, uh, mm, I have, keep, have been computed with different hadronic uh, parameters that, exp uh, that uh, parameterize the hadronic uh, uh, physics uh, that you need to take account when uh, when you compute the cross section. And so you can see different different uh, sets of hadronic parameters give you a certain uh, certain value and therefore you have uh, some uncertainty uh, due to the fact that we don't know these parameters, uh, these hadronic parameters very well. Okay, so this is just a uh, kind of result that you can um, that you can also obtain if you play uh, with this code. Uh, yeah, this brings me to my conclusions. Uh, but to be faster, I think I won't go through this slide. So we're done. Thanks. Not that I know, not that I know. Uh, so as I said, there are other, other. Uh, there are some papers where they study uh, the spin-dependent form factor mm -hmm. m more uh, in detail, but only only for xenon. And anyway, it has nothing to do with this formalism. It's just a spin-dependent form factor. Uh, the question is, uh, how much more efficient is if I have a real model? Right. So the question is how much this is really much more time consuming. It seems I have to learn something else. Yes. Yeah, that's true. I don't know exactly. I'm trying to understand when is the phase transition where it really buys me a lot. Let me give you an example. When we did the software te discovery technical, or now basically we know the Atlas is using it. Yeah, so. so that has been a huge help for, for that. And the Atlas people are using it because they don't care about uh, your model, but they, if they give them the file that allows them to capture it. That's From this point of view, to which extent are really needed in the end if I had a simple model from which I can capture everything? I'm trying to understand this whether. So, so if the model is simple, as, as simple as uh, like spin independent, then you just need to take the points from the lines of the exclusion, okay? Uh, so, this is useless. This is for uh, more for this. Um, Models that are give a bit more uh, involved uh, cross section. Also, you need to know um, unless it is this spin independent cross section, which is trivial, or also the spin dependent, if you want. Um, you have to know how to compute the dark matter nucleus cross section. So I'm pretty sure you know how to compute a dark matter nucleon cross section. The nucleus 
the cross-section with the nucleus is a bit trickier, at least for me. And that's why I think uh, this formalism um, uh, simplifies things. Um, I, I, I'm a very limited being, so all the models I know are, at the end, relatively simple in, in, in low energy to calculate the direct link. Right? So well, for instance, this magnetic moment wasn't... Uh, was not a trivial. Right? Yeah, it was not a trivial, the anapole uh, also. Then, okay. But I mean, you have to calculate these coefficients CI, right? Yes. And in fact, that's what you have to calculate. Right. And the question, if that is... It's not completely obvious to me that whether it actually it buys you something and in the end just to calculate it. I'm trying to understand. It's yes, not, uh, yes, yes. I, th I think it, uh, yeah, it depends what you have to do, right? Also, if you want to... Uh, at some point there were many of these uh, oper um, papers on non-relativistic operators, sorry, effective operators. Uh, if, if you want to, to treat all of them at once, uh, maybe this, this can be... So that was another question. In principle, the construction and the rate is clearly a real number. Yes. But the amplitude in general is a complex. Right. right. So and, and this is a, because it's not completely clear from the equation. So the C's are actually full real. I would assume that that can be complex. And then the cross section of all has to be real. But the typical C and on the amplitude level can be complex. Right? Yes, yes. So for 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 elastic scattering, um, if you have a single cross section at three levels, true. But if I look for like the last one. Okay, let me show you this. Um, so this is the other. So this, this is the amplitude level. Yeah. So, so to be real. right, because all these operators are for elastic scattering. At least all these operators are already admission. So it doesn't have. So so the coefficient must be. But it, yeah, you can have uh, so something. But those were uh, effective theory coefficients, non non relativistic uh, uh, operations. So I don't know, I mean, so I need to think. So I, I don't have an answer, so I'm actually asking if you already knew, because it's not obvious to me. I mean, in general, in quantum field theory, the amplitude is complex. That's true. No, even uh, in. Um, Wait, did, did you say like it's a spin violating dark matter? Yeah. Yeah, well, there, the, we had interference, but I think both pieces were real. Yeah. They had the same yeah. phase. Yeah. But, but in general, the amplitude level, I mean, even in the non relativistic limit, we know. I mean, like that's right. Mechanics and the mechanics is actually complex. Yeah, that's right. So in general, this doesn't have to be real. Right? So then, I, then I would say in this, in this formula, then you need to take the dagger of one of the two, I mean, the star. Right. Right. The, the complex conjugate so of one of the two. So it's not completely obvious to me that I can easily actually. So that's what I mean. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. Also, in, I mean, in, in elastic scattering, this is uh, this. I mean, you have the same operators, but they are not emission uh, anymore for uh, some reason that I don't remember. I, 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 I mean, can't this, can't this Q can't. transforms in a different way. So a simple example of this is the theta angle. CP out over it, so that actually leads to a theta angle dependence, which is complex. And also no relativistic, they have the ordinary electric dipole moment for the neutron, right? So that uh, if you have CP validating uh, interactions, even in the neutron mm -hmm. physics, which we typically get those really just. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, in principle, so you so can have those. So, so here is a number of caveats that already put it on the, your UV theory because in infrared can give you complex amplitudes. Yeah, 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 yes. So it's not general enough. No, and it's not super general. Yeah. I'm trying to understand, it's not... Uh, sure, sure, sure. Uh, but the, the usually, degree. usually this encompasses pretty much all the interactions. I mean... You so far. Yeah. So far, obviously. And uh, also that I know. Uh, I, I don't go and read the string theory paper. Maybe they, they have some crazy stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. So there are also simple stuff still looking you know, for... Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I just want to understand to which extent it was actually... Universal. Yes. Yeah. Then there is there is also another another thing apart from the um, uh, apart from when uh, I mean it buys you to use this formalism instead of uh, computing stuff yourself. Then uh, here in this problem you have several integrals that you need to perform uh, numerically. So, so there you need, you know, a code uh, and anyway, someone or no, you, you need to do the job to, to compute all this stuff. So, then, so, so this asks us another question. I mean, if a new experiment comes up, the new nuclei things like that, or new 
bounds to account. Mm -hmm. okay. So where would that go? In the, uh, I mean, would it already be calculated in the program or? I no. Mean, so, so, so where does it go, that one? Uh, so no no in that case we need to uh, uh, update the program we did it already twice uh, because when we published the paper we only had this four experiments Xenon 100 CDMS Coupe and Picasso and then shortly after uh, also the LUX the, the analysis came out and even the Super CDMS so we made two new updates um, I mean if we think this is worth we, we can keep doing it okay, so the other thing is that some, some, some experiments provide bounds Right. Yes. This is only for bounds so far. Yeah, please. I mean, thank you. Thank God you are asking questions, right? I have a question. Yeah. If you go one slide, there is a layer. Yes. Just here. So this, uh, this coefficient, uh, CIN, uh, is a function of the uh, IMG parameters. Mm. So that the lambda can be uh, cut with the function. But this lambda, actually, I mean, these are considered by their intensity, not requirement. Because in any model, you, uh, it's most of the cases that you have this same capital of tenses in the direction cross section, and they're also responsible for the in this approach, uh, you don't take into account this. What I mean is that this lambda is actually a function of the mass of the other marker, the mass of... Yeah, if you want to constrain this lamp, the, 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 the parameter with the, um, like for instance, uh, the relic density, you have to do it yourself. Uh, so you will have like, yeah. you, you can have a bound on lambda from the detection, and then you can have another constraint uh, from the relic density. Okay. So you have to work with the model. Sure, yeah, we did that. We, this is only, the uh, data detection related. Okay, you can have if you have, for instance, that in your uh, model you have um, two dark matter particles. So the relic density is made up of both of them. Uh, I mean, then then uh, um, there would be no point for us to compute the bound on lambda unless we know the the high energy um, model. Okay, but we can't. We are only working at the very low energy with this non relativistic operator. So this needs to be done by you. Also, if you, uh, I think there are many uh, ways of, to escape this bound. For instance, if you have more dark matter particles, then uh, the, 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 the relic abundance must be the sum of the two relics, right? Yeah, okay, well, what I'm saying is just that uh, maybe uh, the requirement to get the current dark matter density already this is certain, uh, puts, uh, puts bounds that are much stronger than the ones that you can derive. Okay. If okay. you require that you want to recruit the red density, then uh, uh, you can predict immediately that you, you, you don't understand anything in things. You know? Fine, fine. So this depends on the model. This for, depends on for, the model. Yeah. yeah, this depends on the model. In some models, many, I would say many, I mean the most usual models that you find in dark matter, for dark matter, uh, the ones studied for data detection, these bounds are much better than the relic. Uh, than the bounds of the relic. No, no, it's not always the case. It depends on the operator. It depends on the, it depends on the operator. Okay. For example, take the recent uh, game we're playing with, uh, with EM, right? So we have a methodically six depth master where the captain constant master gets stronger and good for it gets weak in infrared. And basically, uh, you, you, you have. You know, the two carbon constants are everybody in the line here. Yeah. 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 The interference can happen also if the couplings are real. Yes, yes, yes. yes, 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 yes. Okay, but but the, 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 if the couplings are complex, yeah, you, you need to be careful. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's no theory in the couplings. In principle, they're only saying that CPT or CPT can be violated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In principle, yeah. So yes. So so this is not super general. No, no, this course. is actually so basically you yeah, have emissions operators with the real coupling and the <coughs> underlying assumption on what kind of CPT and CPT. Yeah. 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 
So these are all the possible nuclear operators. So this is the only thing you can actually have. Uh, so no, that's for the complex calculus. These these are not even all. Uh, this is a selection of the operators. Um, I think it's a, a, a so a, um, with with these four degrees of freedom you can write I think up to six, sixteen operators. These are the most important in the sense that this. Uh, appear in the literature and the other don't. And then I think you can also even uh, start in, uh, multiplying them one another, but then you go, you go to higher order in the non-relativistic expansion. So, uh, so these are even more further suppressed. So in principle, yes, you, this, um, yeah, you have an inf infinite uh, uh, number of, of operators. This should be, in some sense, the most important or relevant. But they should be. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, it is, uh, yeah, this is an expansion on, on uh, in powers of Q divided by some mass. All the masses that enter in the problem are GV, uh, and also velo the velocity, which is uh, divided by the speed of light. Okay. Uh,